I have a big problem in my oral microbiome, and that involves the bacterium Ceratia marquescens, or Ceratia for short. Ceratia has been linked with many adverse health human conditions, including pneumonia, sepsis, meningitis, and so on down the list. Now, I currently have seven oral microbiome tests, and Ceratia has been fortunately zero on two of those tests, but as we can see, it has, has been far from zero on the other five. 40%, 41% for one of the tests, but you can see for the other four, at least 88% and as high as 96%. In other words, almost all of my oral bacteria, all, all of my oral microbiome is completely dominated by Ceratia for at least five of these seven tests. So for test number eight, the plan was to potentially decrease Ceratia by following correlations with diet. But then also, could I increase levels of bacteria that are inversely correlated with Ceratia by also following correlations with diet? And there were eight bacteria that fell into that category. And if you missed that video, it'll be in the right corner as I described this process in full detail. So for the abridged version for this video, I'm basically addressing the question, is there a diet oral microbiome axis? So for the foods that were significantly correlated with those nine bacterium, we can see the ones that had the greatest overlap with the almost majority of those nine bacterium here. So they included mushrooms, yogurt, onion, and protein. Now the foods that are color coded in red would suggest that I eat towards the lower end of my range, my intake range for these seven tests as higher levels were significantly correlated with either lower levels of the inverse Ceratia bacteria or higher levels of Ceratia. So I want to eat towards the lower end of my range to follow that correlation. Conversely, for yogurt, that was significantly correlated with five of the nine bacterium and going in the right direction. So either lower Ceratia or higher levels of the inversely correlated with Ceratia bacteria. So then the question is, did I follow the correlation? So I took the 30-day average prior to this test, uh, or test number eight, and then we can see that for mushrooms, uh, my average intake during those 30 days was 209 grams. So that's towards the lower end of my range, which is following the correlation. As I mentioned, the red data indicates I want to eat towards the lower end of my range to follow the correlation. For yogurt, it was 144 grams per day, but note that for the last 20 days before the test, it was exactly 150 grams, so I'm following that correlation too. And then for onions and protein, we can see that my intake was towards the lower end of the range, thereby following the correlation. So I followed correlations for these four foods as they had the majority of the overlap for these nine bacterium, either directly impacting Ceratia or other bacteria that could potentially crowd out Ceratia. So did it work? Unfortunately not. For test number eight that I took in September of 2023, Ceratia levels were 96%. Again, it's completely dominating my oral microbiome. There's almost nothing else in my oral microbiome besides this one bacterium. With this one bacterium that's associated with a whole bunch of adverse human health related conditions. So what, will I, what did I do for test number nine? So I noticed that on the two days that I had zero, it, dietary intake for a couple of things were different than the other five tests. So could I impact Ceratia levels by, by uh, following uh, correlations for foods that were on the days where I had zero versus the non-zero days. And for a food that popped up was cardamom, the spice cardamom, which was two grams per day on the two days where I had zero serratia, but it was only 0.2 grams per day on average for the other five tests. Now, I don't, I don't know, and I didn't know if this experiment would work, and it may seem like I'm pulling at straws, just trying to throw anything and see what'll stick, but sometimes that's how it goes. So did it work? So I tried two grams of cardamom for three days, including two days before the test and uh, two grams on the day or the morning of the test, a few hours before, but that didn't work either. We can see that Cerati levels were 95% for the test in October of 2023. So we can see through, through 10 tests, Cerati marquescence is still a problem in my oral micro microbiome. So what's the plan for test number 10? So to address that, let's take a step back and take a look at all, all nine tests to see if maybe there's some pattern in that data for what I did or what I could potentially do for test number 10 that may work. And note that these data are generated by Bristol. And if you wanna measure your own oral microbiome composition, there'll be a discount link in the video's description. So for the first five tests, in addition to toothbrushing and string, fro string flossing daily, I used a homemade mouthwash, which included 1% xylitol, 1% sodium bicarbonate, 
so, sorry, sodium bicarbonate and a few drops of peppermint oil. And that was in one liter of water. So I used that for the first two tests exclusively. And for one test, you can see Serrati was 88%. For the second, it was zero, which would potentially argue against this mouthwash, this homemade mouthwash, which I used uh, three to five times per day. So after meals and then just randomly throughout the day. So that I had zero on one day and 88% on the other argues against the potential role for this mouthwash doing anything. I mean, how can it be very high and then zero? It suggests that something else may be at play. But let's see how the story plays out. Maybe that's not the case. So for test number three, to this mouthwash, I added four grams per liter of potassium nitrate, as nitrate has been shown to act as a prebiotic for the oral microbiome, basically feeding some of the quote-unquote good, good guys while crowding out some of the quote-unquote bad guys. Now, I'm already on a high nitrate-containing diet, and I detailed this fully in earlier videos. If you missed the oral microbiome playlist, I put that whole playlist in the right corner. So four grams of potassium nitrate added to this mouthwash. You can see 41% serratia, so still not 95% on the right track. So then for the test number four, I reduced the potassium nitrate concentration in the mouthwash to two grams per liter and also added a few drops of clove oil. So to the initial homemade mouthwash solution, xylitol, sodium bicarbonate, peppermint oil was also potassium nitrate and clove oil. And here we can see test number four, zero serratia. So maybe that this mouthwash did have something to do with potentially reducing serratia. I don't know yet. For test number five, back to 95 or up to 95%, this was the base formulation of the mouthwash, xylitol, sodium bicarbonate, peppermint oil, but then I also added berberine, which clearly didn't do anything. And then for test number six, I didn't use this mouthwash at all because I didn't have any data without it. So I wanted to see what would happen. No mouthwash at all, just using water after meals as a mouthwash, and then randomly swishing water throughout the day, in addition to toothbrushing and uh, string flossing daily. But I did include also a uh, water pick and tongue scraping, but we can see that combination didn't do anything to serratia at night, as it stated, 95% for this test. For test number seven, I did use a version of the homemade mouthwash, but this time 5% xylitol, as there's a published in vitro study showing that high concentrations of xylitol, especially 5% or higher, can reduce serratia levels by about 80%. And so, but there was no bicarbonate or peppermint oil in that mouthwash. So same system, three to five, three to five times per day, but that didn't impact serratia either. It was at 96% following, uh, I don't remember the exact amount of days, but again, I detailed how long I did that for in an earlier video. For test number eight, again, no homemade mouthwash, but I follow the correlations with diet, which we just saw didn't work. And for test number nine, it was the cardamom day of the diet uh, experiment, which also didn't work. So when comparing the first five days of data with an average of about 45% serratia versus the last four tests, which about have an average of about 95.5%, clearly there may be something to the, the having some formulation of that mouthwash in the in the everyday approach. And when using a two sample t-test, they are indeed significantly different with the first five tests being significantly lower than the last four tests. So with that in mind, for test number 10, I'm gonna to return to the original formulation of the homemade mouthwash, xylitol, sodium bicarbonate, and peppermint oil. I can't say if I'll go how many more tests with just that formulation to collect enough data, but I'm considering adding in a couple grams of potassium nitrate to see what, they may, what that may do to the uh, serratia levels. So stay tuned for that in an upcoming video. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount links and merch that you may be interested in, including discount links for oral microbiome composition, epigenetic and telomere testing, NAD quantification, at-home metabolomics, at-home blood testing with Cyfox Health, including ApoB, green tea, diet tracking with chronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me A Coffee. We've also got merch. So if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Dietran Grant, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.